My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in Upper Pergamum, sitting on ruins from the Temple of Dionysus. That's what these are. This is a cornice. This is a fallen column from the Temple of Dionysus, which was a horrible place. It was horrible because of the demonic activities which took place inside this temple. Drunkenness, drugs, sacrifices, all kinds of horrible things. And Christians stayed away from these places because this had been their former place. This is where they had previously lived their lives. And when they got saved, they were delivered from all of this. Now they were walking free of all of this, living very strict, separate lives according to the teaching of the Bible. But there was a group in Pergamum called the Nicolaitans who said, hey, we're living too separate. We're living too strict. Pagans don't understand us. We don't go to the theater. We don't go to the bathhouse. We don't go to the temples. And we're misunderstood. Why don't we compromise just a little bit, act a little bit more like the world so that the world will accept us? This was called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's referred to in Revelation chapter 2. The word Nicolaitan is a compound word, the word Nike, which means victory or even to conquer, and the word Laos, which is the word for laity or people. You put the two words together. It's those who conquer the people or those who have victory over the people. And what we find is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which was a doctrine of compromise, brought a defeat to the people. It was a teaching that conquered God's people. This was a people conquering teaching because when God's people compromise, they lose. They lose power, they lose holiness, they lose victory. When God's people compromise, it always results in defeat. And that's why Jesus hated the teachings of the Nicolaitans. He didn't hate the Nicolaitans, but he hated what they taught. And likewise, we need to take a strong stand against compromise. We need to walk in love, but we also need to walk in holiness. If we want to walk in power, then we have to walk by a higher standard. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. As I told you in the open, today we're going to be looking at a false doctrine that was trying to get inside the church at Pergamum. It was a doctrine of compromise. Wow, that is something we don't want to embrace. Christ is against those who compromise their faith. And today you're going to see that very clearly in Scripture. Actually, today we're going to continue looking just a little bit at who was Antipas. Then we're going to see who was Balaam, because Balaam is the example of those who bring compromise. It's really going to be powerful. Stay with me all the way to the end of the program. And by the way, if you need prayer, contact us. We're here. We're waiting for you. My team just longs to hear from you so they can get on the phone and pray with you or answer your email or your letter. We're really serious about praying for people. And if you have no one else to pray with you, call us. We're here. We would love to minister to you. And I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Pergamum. Are you enjoying this teaching about Pergamum? I'm just eating it up. And I hope that you're enjoying it as well. It's so rich to see what Jesus had to say to the church of Pergamum, which has so much application to us, the end time church, a church that is so tempted to compromise, but Christ calls us not to compromise. But this is a 10 part series based on these programs with all the Greek points and the history and the video and the photos and a study guide that is simply amazing. You will love the study guide. It's perfect for your personal study, to share with a friend, and it is really ideal for a Bible study group. I encourage you to get it. We're also offering you my book called No Room for a Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. The back of the book says, in this book, you will receive a sobering charge to stand up for faith in Christ, regardless of the price you are required to pay. Winds of opposition against the church are gathering. As pagan influences continue to increase in society in these last days, we will have to make a decision to stand for faith and not compromise. And that's what this book is about. It's over 400 pages. It's very large. You'll enjoy it, believe me. You'll probably put it on your coffee table. That's what a lot of people do. 
and you'll flip through its pages all the time. Your grandchildren will enjoy this. Your children will enjoy this. Visitors to your home will want to flip through the pages because it's all full color and captures the world of the church in the first century. You will love this book. So order your copy today. No room for compromise. But today we're going to jump right back into Revelation chapter 2. We're covering so much material, and I'm sorry we're moving so fast, but there's no choice if we're going to cover it all. But today we're going to jump back into Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, where Jesus is speaking to the church in Pergamum. And listen to what he says. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. We saw that Pergamum was really a throne for Satan's power. Satan's power prospered there. Satan thrived there in so much that Jesus said Satan's seat is there. The Greek word thronos, which is really the word for a throne. He ruled like a king. He was the indisputed master of the house. Satan had the say-so in Pergamum until the church came along and the church began to threaten Satan's hold on the city. The job of the church is always to unseat the devil. You're to unseat the devil in your life. You're to unseat the devil in your family. But Jesus said to them, Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you. The Bible says even in those days. In Greek it is plural. It describes a series of days or a prolonged period of time, a time of persecution that seems to have been triggered with the death of Antipas. The church had not been looked on favorably because they were so different from paganism. But when Antipas died, a passive resistance stopped and a very aggressive persecution began in persecution in in Pergamum against the church. And the Bible specifically talks about Antipas. Who was Antipas? This is the only time he's ever mentioned in the Bible. But he's a very notable character. Jesus was so proud of him that Jesus called him by name. Jesus knows you. Jesus is proud of you when you stand for faith. What do we know about Antipas? Well, the name Antipas, if you want to divide it, really it's two compound, It's a compound word made of two Greek words. The word anti means against. The word pas means all. You compound the two words together and figuratively, the name Antipas can be taken to mean one who is against everything. Antipas against all. Let me read to you from my notes. It can figuratively describe a person who is against everything. It carries the idea of one who is antisocial, contrary, noncompliant, intolerant, narrow-minded, a nonconformist, inflexible, obstinate, or uncompromising. Listen to this. When people came to Christ in the first century, the act of repentance was such a defining moment of change in their lives. It was a moment that required a total transformation and separation from the godless world around them. And unbelievers did not understand the separation that Christians put between themselves and the godless world. Unbelievers thought Christians were antisocial or just against everything. They had suspicions about Christians and believed that believers in Jesus were antisocial, Contrary, incompliant, intolerant, narrow minded, nonconformist, inflexible, obstinate, and uncompromising. And pagans just did not get it. What is wrong with these Christians? Why do they have to live so separate, so different from the rest of us? Let me give you some examples. Christians refused to go to the theater, they refused. And the theater was a very central part of life at that time. The reason they wouldn't go to the theater was because of the depravity that took place on the stage. Christians wouldn't go to athletic events because athletic events were performed in the nude, so Christians stayed away. Christians wouldn't go to the bathhouses because in the bathhouses, deviant activities took place. Christians wouldn't go into temples, pagan temples, and wouldn't burn incense to the emperor, and that was viewed as being unpatriotic. And the view of the pagans was that Christians were antisocial, nonconformists, inflexible, obstinate, uncompromising? Why can't they just let down their guard and blend in with us a little bit more? That's what the pagans thought of Christians. And so some people say on the basis of this that the word Antipas is just a figurative term to describe 
what the world thought of Christians at that time, and figuratively, that's true. However, there really was a man named Antipas, an early believer, and here he is memorialized in this verse. Antipas, what do we know about him? Well, because early church fathers did a lot of writing, we know what happened to this man named Antipas. Antipas was a leader in the church. Some allege he might have even been one of the early pastors of the church in Pergamum. And he died a horrific death. He was arrested for casting out demons. He was casting out demons. And the pagan priests in Pergamum were upset because Antipas was disturbing the spirit realm. And the pagan priests went to the proconsul, went to the governor and said, do something about this man. So Antipas was brought before the governor. The governor commanded him to reject his faith. And Antipas did exactly what Revelation chapter 2, verse 13 says. He held tightly to the name of Jesus. He refused to deny his faith. And therefore, the proconsul, the governor said, you're going to die. And we even know how he died. On the Acropolis of Pergamum was a brazen bull. You say, what in the world is a brazen bull? Well, it was a big statue of a bull. And it was made out of metal, probably out of copper. But it was hollow. From its exterior, it looked like a bull. It had horns. It had eyes. But on the side of it, there was a door. And the door could be opened. And here is what they would do in this horrific act of core torture. They would take individuals, bind them with ropes, place them inside the brazen bull, which was made of metal, probably of copper. Then they would close the door. So the individual is wrapped up with ropes, placed inside this brazen bull made of metal. And then they would set a fire under the brazen bull. And as the fire began to burn, the metal would begin to get hotter and hotter and hotter, and it would literally fry the person who was inside the brazen bull. And to make matters even more gross, musical instruments, pipes, were constructed in the head of the brazen bull. As the person inside the brazen bull was being cooked to death and began to yell, rather than hear the yells and the screams of a man who was dying, the screaming would go through those pipes and come through the pipes in the head of the brazen bull, and it would appear to make the bull to begin to bellow like a real bull. So the dying person seemed to give life to the bull. That is what they did to Antipas. Antipas was cooked inside a brazen bull on the Acropolis in the city of Pergamum. We know that because of documents written in very early centuries of the church. It was just horrific, horrific what happened to this man. And listen to how Jesus describes him in Revelation 2 verse 13. He says, you've not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr. The Greek reads very differently. The Greek says, ho martos moi ho pistos. It's very important in Greek, and it's very different than what you read in the English. The Greek says, the witness of mine, the faithful one. The word witness is the Greek word martus. The word martus describes one who is summoned to testify in a court of law or to present evidence or proof. A legal witness was only allowed to speak what he personally knew to be true. This personal insight qualified a person to be a witness worthy of being put on the public stand for examination. The word martus, the word witness, also conveys the idea of suffering because when a person was called to be a witness, he was required to be faithful to the truth regardless of any possible acts of retribution that might be carried out against him by those who didn't appreciate his witness. It was understood that being a witness could place a person or his loved ones in jeopardy. To be a witness, therefore, required a person to have the highest level of integrity, commitment, and a willing to sacrifice himself or his status to uphold the truth. This is what the word martyr meant. This word witness, which means he was put on the investigation stand. He was interrogated. He had such quality, such integrity when it came to his faith that Jesus knew he could be depended upon. And that is why Jesus calls him faithful. The Greek actually says the faithful one. You could translate it the faithful one, 
or the trustworthy one, Christ found him absolutely faithful and absolutely trustworthy in spite of what he was going to be put through for remaining faithful, for being true to his witness. How about you? Are you being faithful to your witness? Does a little pressure cause you to fudge on your faith? Or are you really being faithful to your witness? Would Jesus call you his faithful witness? That should be a goal in your life. If Antipas was the first believer to be executed for his faith in Pergamum, which might be the case, he was called to be killed in a public way, in a public platform. This was very public. In fact, the Bible goes on to say in verse 13, he was slain among you, slain among you. The Greek word really means right alongside of you or right in your very midst. And the Bible says he was slain. The word slain is horrific. It is a Greek word, apokteno. This word apokteno means to slay or to kill. The abrupt taking away of a person's life. It is murder, execution execution, mass killing. It describes violent death. One scholar says it presents the idea of butchery, carnage, a brutal, grisly, and gruesome death. And that is exactly what happened to this brother named Antipas. His death was horrible. It was butchery. It was grisly. What they did to him by placing him in that brazen bull and cooking him to death And Jesus said, it happened among you. You were all there. You saw it. This happened visibly. This happened publicly. This did not happen somewhere in the corner. This happened right in the middle of town. Everyone knew of it. And Jesus says that it happened in this city where Satan's seat was. Amazing. The word Satan, where Satan dwelleth. Again, the word Satan is the Greek word satana one who hates, accuses, or slanders, or conspires against. Jesus, by using this word, says, yes, it's in that same city where Satan is conspiring against you, in the city where Satan dwellest. The word dwellest, again, the Greek word ket, oikeo, where Satan feels so comfortable. He thinks that he's the ruler of the house, and therefore he thinks he can do whatever he wants, and that includes killing people like Antipas. Wow. This church had been through so much. Satan was a real enemy to this congregation, a real enemy. But as horrific as all the pagan persecution was, there was something happening to the church that was even worse than outside persecution. Something worse than that was happening to this church. What in the world was it? False doctrine was trying to develop inside the church. It was a spiritual disease that was being carried by members of the congregation. And if the infection was not stopped, Jesus knew that it would spread to the entire church and it would affect the longevity of the church. So Jesus is going to tell them to deal with it in no uncertain terms. He begins in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, where Jesus says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of... Balaam. Now we come to Balaam. First of all, the very beginning of verse 14, it says, but. The word but is the Greek word Allah. The word Allah means nevertheless. You could translate it like this. Notwithstanding all these wonderful things that I've said about you to this point, I do have something against you. What did he have against them? Whatever it was, he felt it very personally. He says, I have. The word I have is the Greek word echo. The word echo means to feel something very personally, to hold it very personally, to feel it very deeply. Echo, the word I have. It tells us that Christ was personally disturbed by what he was about to describe. A false doctrine was being promoted by some inside the church. And the words I have emphatically tell us that Christ was personally disturbed by this false doctrine. After this church had withstood wave after wave of horrific persecution. Now evil was lurking right in the middle of them, which was more deadly than the persecution. The seduction from the inside was dangerous. Errant spiritual leaders, leaders who had veered off track, were suggesting that the church began to compromise their faith in order to get along with the world. 
Isn't that exactly what people are saying today? Just tone it down. Don't be so strict. Water it down a little bit in order to get along with your pagan neighbors so the world won't think you're so strict and so obstinate and unyielding. Just tone it down, water it down. That is exactly what they were saying in the early church. And Jesus was very deeply disturbed by it. He even uses the word, I have, the Greek word echo, which means I have it. I feel it personally. This is very near to me, very dear to me. I feel this very deeply. Jesus was extremely disturbed by this tendency to compromise. The dark path that these spiritual leaders were suggesting would weaken the church, weaken the gospel, and weaken the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything about it was bad. It was a spiritual sickness that was going to weaken the church. And Jesus calls it the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam? Who in the world is Balaam? Balaam was that Old Testament prophet who introduced compromise among God's people. And due to his teachings and his suggestions of compromise, Balaam brought God's people down. And God dealt with it severely. God is against compromise on every level. And according to this verse, Jesus says, I have a few things against you. The word few, the Greek word oligia, it describes small in number, which tells us this infection was not widespread in the church. There was just a few who were infected by this doctrine, but it was beginning to multiply inside the church, just like an infection. An infection usually begins at a microscopic level, and it can be dealt with fairly easy if you catch it when it's small. If you don't deal with it, that infection, which began at a microscopic level, begins to grow out of control until when finally you become entirely sick and weakened by it. And Jesus said, right now you're at a small stage. Just a few of you are infected, but if you don't take charge of this and stop it now, it's going to get out of control. And Jesus referred to the false doctrine as the doctrine of Balaam. Now you're going to see later that he calls it the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans is a compound of Nike, which means to conquer, and the word laos, which is a Greek word for people. Put the two words together, Nicolaitans. It describes those who conquer the people, or they were advocating a teaching or a new way of teaching that would suppress God's people, conquer the people, pull a plug on the power, pull a plug on the Word of God, pull a plug on the work of the Holy Spirit, and bring God's people down. You see, that is what compromise does compromise is fatal to your life and it is fatal to the life of the church and God calls on you and me to make the decision to have no compromise in our lives. This is very powerful. Now when we come back in the next program we're going to continue to look very in depth at who is this Balaam and who is the Balaams that we have to deal with today and what is the doctrine he taught and what is the doctrine of Balaam in the church today? It's going to be powerful. Don't miss it. But I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Explore the Bible and the first century church with Rick Renner's book, No Room for Compromise. In this masterful hardback Bible study, Rick transports you to the first century and the life of the early church, exploring the relevance of Jesus' end-time message to the church of Pergamum then and how that end-time message is relevant today. On every page, Rick reveals the larger context of the book of Revelation and his appearance to the Apostle John, taking you on a journey through the first three centuries of Christian opposition within a pagan world. You'll be amazed to see how the early church thrived through the light, life, and power of Jesus Christ. This beautifully bound 400-page book, available for just $55, features on-location photography, added artwork, and historical illustrations that enhance the in-depth teaching. When you call or go online today, you can also get the 10-part teaching series, Christ's Message to the Church in Pergamum. As one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the church in Pergamum was a light of faith in the pagan darkness. In this series, you'll see how Jesus' message of holding on to faith is just as relevant today as it was in the first century. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. Don't miss this special offer, No Room for Compromise, and Christ's message to the church in Pergamum. Call now, 1-800-742-5593, or go to renner.org to order. 
My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from our Moscow TV studio. And I wanted to say thank you to all of our ministry supporters. It's because of your support that we can do our work, reaching out to the forgotten people. One of our primary works in Moscow is reaching out to the outcasts of society, shut-ins, the homeless, the mentally ill, the orphaned, the disabled, street kids, and the incarcerated. Our ministry is involved with each one of these outreaches where we demonstrate care in ways that words alone can never do. But there are so many more that still need our help. So many more people battling hunger, poverty, mental illness, so many more orphans and children with special needs that need our help. Would you consider joining us as partners today? Your gifts can lift more people up that society has forgotten. We can't do this work without your financial support. When you give, we are able to take the gospel both to our nearby world and to the ends of the earth. We all have a part to play. Right from your home right now, you can help us help others by becoming our partner in the work, by supporting our work financially. Please call 1-800-742-5593 or go online to renner.org to give. Through your support, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives. We live in a day when people are tempted to compromise their faith, to modify what they believe because the culture is changing, the mindset of society is changing, and what used to be totally wrong, today people are saying is okay. People are changing their morals, they're changing what they think about sexuality and gender and everything else you can imagine. There is a mass modification that is taking place. And as believers, we do not have to go around with the rest of the crowd. It's okay if we're different. We're called to be different. We're not called to be like the world or to think like the world. We have a stand that is fixed. The Word of God is unchangeable. And if the world wants to go in a wrong direction, they can go in that direction. But we're called to stand true to the declaration of the Word of God and not compromise. Don't compromise your faith. You don't have to go the rest of the way that the world is going in. You don't have to. Let them go if that's where they want to go. But keep your head on straight. Wow. I'm speaking to you from my series called Christ's message to Pergamum. Oh, I want you to have this series. You can use it personally or with a friend or in a Bible study group. And we're also offering you my book that I highly recommend called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. Don't compromise. Stand in faith. Remain stationary on what you believe. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that we can be faithful. We can be faithful witnesses. We can be true to what we believe. We can please you with our steadfastness of faith. Help us to do it. We thank you for the power to do it in Jesus' name. This has been awesome. Tomorrow I'm going to come back and talk to you about Balaam and what was his doctrine and what was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's going to really be good. I look forward to seeing you. But remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. You see, God's word is what has power. Don't veer from the word of God and let its power be released in your life today. I'll see you in the next program. Thank you for joining Rick Renner today. For more information about Rick Renner Ministries and product resources, visit renner.org and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.